So we're now ready to talk about the next major topic area in the course, which is reactive programming with Java Completable Futures. We've covered reactive streams and reactive programming with Completable Futures very, very superficially early on, just to show the scope of the class. We spent most of our time talking about sequential and parallel streams, and now it's time to talk about reactive programming. So this particular part of the lesson will explain the key principles that underlie the reactive programming paradigm, which are responsiveness, resilience, elasticity, and being message driven. So reactive programming is an asynchronous programming paradigm concerned with processing streams of data and propagating changes from publishers to subscribers. And you can read more about it here at this link. There's a lot of discussion about this. It's, it's become a very fairly popular paradigm in the last four or five years. It's particularly useful in certain scenarios, and it should come as no surprise that some of those scenarios are quite what we've been doing in this course, so it'll be relevant for what we're doing. One is processing user events. So let's say you're in Android and you've got lots of events that are happening, like people moving their fingers around the screen or getting information from GPS location signals to tell you where you are. If you're on a other kind of device, it's not a touch screen, more like a traditional less desktop or laptop. You have mouse movements, mouse clicks, and so on. These are all events. And the reactive programming model is very nice for that because you basically have subscribers that are waiting for events to happen. And then something's detecting those events, and they're propagating it to the subscribers. And then they do stuff in response. Another place that reactive programming is very useful is responding to and processing latency-bound I.O. events. So a good example would be having some kind of a publisher subscriber environment, for example, Twitter has a feed or feeds that come out of the Twitter servers. And when people tweet, they go to the server and then it gets disseminated out to all the people who are subscribing to those feeds. For example, to certain Twitter users, you might follow Elon Musk or whatever who you want to follow or Lady Gaga. And that stuff then gets sent out to a bunch of different observers that may be on different types of devices. You could have people on mobile phones, probably the predominant way you tweet and receive tweets these days, but you could also have laptops and desktops and so on. And there could also be some event filtering and event management and event analysis in between the publishers and the subscribers. So you might have something that will do sentiment analysis to see whether people are liking certain things. You know, if you post something, a cat video or whatever, then people may like it, they may not like it, they may be sad, they may be amazed and so on. And all that information could be filtered out and then analyzed and processed. And all this stuff takes place asynchronously in a network using a pub-sub style architecture. So that's another common thing to do. Yet another thing you could do is to communicate between microservices in a modern web-based computing environment. And in this particular environment, you would have a bunch of microservices running in some background data center in a cluster or whatnot. And when clients send re uh, requests, they don't go to the microservices directly. They go to something called an API gateway. And it serves as a mediator that takes requests from clients and then farms them out to the various microservices running around in the background to do stuff. And in fact, your programming assignment number two had a server that was implemented that way. You had the main controller that was the API gateway, and it disseminated the requests that came in back to microservices. However, it did not use reactive programming. It used traditional Java synchronous streams programming. So we can also do reactive programming here as well. So these are some of the different types of interaction models and use cases that reactive programming supports. There are four key principles in reactive programming, responsiveness, resilience, elasticity, and then message driven. And we're going to talk about each of these four principles very briefly. So the first principle is responsive. And what that means is you want your program, your microservice or whatnot, to provide rapid and consistent response times. You don't want to have it delay for a long period of time. Ideally, you'd like to be able to have reliable upper bounds on the time taken to deliver the material and process it to give you more consistent quality of service and to prevent undue delay, because undue delay is annoying. If you're a user these days, we've all become very ADD in the sense that we want our responses right back when we do anything on the web. And we don't want to sit there and have one of these uh, hourglass icons or a spinning wheel that says things are slow and they're taking too long. So responsiveness is one principle of reactive programming. Another important principle of reactive programming is resilience. 
you want the system to remain responsive even when things go wrong. In particular, just because one computation fails shouldn't cause the entire system to come to a screeching halt. If you fail, like we looked at earlier when we were talking about exception handling, you just want that particular operation to fail, not all the operations to fail. And there's a lot of interesting subtleties involved with that. But the key point is you want your system to be resilient. Nothing is more annoying than having one thing go down and everything stops. Another important principle is elasticity. And what that means is the system should remain responsive even as the workload goes up. And this is something that's commonly known as auto-scaling. So if you do a lot of cloud computing work, if you take the cloud computing course here or perhaps the big data course at Vanderbilt, you'll see that you want things to auto-scale, which means that when you get more work, you grow the amount of processing resources to do the work, typically by allocating additional computers in a cluster or cores in a multi-core machine or both, some combination of those things. And then the fourth and final principle is a little bit different than the other three, message-driven. So the other three were more about quality of service properties. This is more about implementation. And so we would like to have the program developed with reactive programming principles be defined using asynchronous message passing, which is one of the key hallmarks. We'll see a lot of that when we talk about completable futures and reactive streams later. And the reason for doing this is we want to be able to have loose coupling, which means things are not tightly coupled. We want to have isolation. Things can be put into different microservices running in different containers on different processes or different machines. And we would ideally like location transparency between the components, meaning we can scale things up and out without having to change the way the code is written. And that, of course, all these things require a bunch of patterns like future and proxy and broker and pub sub and stuff like that. But that is another key principle. Now, in practice, oftentimes the reactive programming model gives you a nice method-oriented veneer that uses message passing under the hood. Passing messages explicitly is kind of error-prone and tedious. So we usually wrap a method call facade around this stuff. But under the hood, messages are being created and passed around and queued up and, and processed when appropriate in the right context. So those are the key reactive programming principles. Now, at this point, it's probably still a little bit vague as to what these things mean. But of course, we will cover that in much more detail as we go through the rest of the lesson.